Ah, tēnā koutou koutou, uh, ko matatoa te waka, ko māwao te maunga, ko tauranga te moana, ko Ngāti Kārangi te hāpū, ko Ngāti Rangi te iwi, ko Whareroa te marae, ko Rua Hini Puhi me Naromata Kavo te tangata, um, ko Lewis William Zaha. Um, good morning, it's uh, really nice to be here and it's um, it's actually really, it's great to be able to see you in your working environment, um, Ian. Um, when you're on Skype and laptops, you kind of imagine where someone is. Um, but that, so it's really lovely to be able to see you in context here. Um, so we mentioned that we've had a working relationship um, for some years and we mentioned some of the lineage of that. Um, some of my own lineage in terms of uh, where I come from personally uh, represented in these two pictures here. Um, when I introduced myself, I used what is called a, a pepeha, and that's um, a type of Māori um, greeting. So part of my ancestry is Māori, the indigenous peoples of Aotearoa. And in a, in a nutshell, I told you that uh, my ancestors came to Aotearoa on the waka or canoe called the Mata Atua, which um, literally means the face of God. I told you that our mountain, our sacred mountain, is um, Māo, which means caught at the dawn. I told you that the area, um, the ocean and the lands are the Tauranga Moana. I told you the name of our people, the sub-tribe, uh, our meeting place, the Marae, and then I named a couple of important ancestors. And so th those, that's some of the foundations that I stand on, which we call Tūranga Waiwai. Another important foundation for me um, actually hails back to the Isle of Arran on Scotland and um, these are the standing stones on Makru Moor um, which um, I visited with my mother in 2007 and uh, they are very, um, you know, very powerful beings. So a couple of the important foundations, we're, we're in the context of a seminar so I won't say too much more than that, but that's, these are important aspects um, and life sources that, that support me wherever I am. Uh, I want to dedicate this talk to uh, Maria Hokimata Natai. Um, she's one of the uh, queer or elders um, in the Ngāitarangi um, tribe, uh, my tribe, and has been very um, important to me in helping me to be who I am, and uh, Auntie Maria passed away in um, very recently. Uh, and these are some other important um, Auntie Naroa Mata there on the left, and my parents um, Shirley and John Williams on the right there. All important part of my foundations. Uncle Kihi um, is Auntie Maria's husband, and he's the chief of Ngātarangi. And this talk, I'm going to relay a very short dream to you because this, what I'm going to talk about today is intergenerational resilience and I'm going to give a very holistic um, understanding of this, con of this concept and try, try and convey a holistic understanding and I know that some of the centre's work is around um, water, um, food sovereignty, agriculture, sustainability. So I think um, this particular dream offers a very powerful metaphor of intergenerational resilience. So the dream is that shortly after Auntie Naromata, Uncle Kihi's cousin, passed away, I dreamt that I, my wairua, my spirit, went back to Aotearoa, New Zealand. And I went to visit Uncle Kihi and Auntie Maria. In the dream, Auntie Maria was out Uncle Kihi was home and he was very sad because his, his cousin had passed away. But he was, he was okay, he was just very quiet, very much in himself and he was turning, he was hoeing the soil, he was turning over the soil. And in the dream when he turned to face me, his face was completely tattooed and his hair was long. When I related the dream to him some time later, he said, well, in Māori tanga, that can be the spirit is standing, from a past life is standing over the person telling them what to do. 
But the point of the dream, if we think about intergenerational resilience, so here is this man in his later days, 80, in his 80s, he's quietly tilling the soil. The soil was actually, it was, it was bare, but he was tilling it over. And if you think of that as a metaphor for intergenerational resilience, right, what we try and do to make way for the coming generation so that there can be new growth. So think about that in human terms and in terms of um, the rest of the natural world as well. Okay, um, that I'm going to talk a little bit about working with food sovereignty and sustainability within the context of the Alliance for Intergenerational Resilience, which has a number of um, emerging innovations in food sovereignty um, in Aotearoa, in Canada and in the UK. They're very emergent, um, but I'm going to talk about frame this a little bit in terms of looking at the synergies between these different innovations and um, how in time we might be able to generate some collective impact through working together and drawing these synergies. This really, um, I think these two quotes really hit at the nub of um, intergenerational resilience and some of the challenges that we face. So the first one is by a um, First Nations person. And they say, spiritual and intellectual integrity is achieved on Turtle Island, that's North America, by the interplay of human and more than human consciousness. Yet diminishing biodiversity augurs against the continued capacity to know how to think with everything. So, if we think about intergenerational resilience and resilience within an indigenous cosmological framework, there is that it goes as far as the interconnectedness of energy and consciousness, right? And no thought is independent. So that's something that the new science, new versions of Western science have proved as well. So as, our, as the biodiversity diminishes, so does our human capacity to be, to think, to be. Um, so I think that quote speaks to that very powerfully. The second one um, was by a young woman at the Elders' Voices Summit, um, a summit held in Canada by the Alliance for Intergenerational Resilience a couple of years ago. And this young woman voices her concerns about the elders and the youth in her communities being able to connect meaningfully and pass on traditional knowledge. Um, this, by the way, um, is uh, Turtle Island, um, it, it's Canada, so for First Nations um, people in Canada, um, the big landmass that we know of, uh, of as North America um, is in fact um, the, the back of a turtle, and, and so the land in terms of indigenous cosmologies is um, feminine. Okay. I don't think I um, need to spend too much time on this. This is just some of the challenges um, that, that we're perhaps facing now. And I, um, so basically, this slide is about the um, predominance of um, consumerism, the, the disconnect that many people are experiencing from the land, right? So it's often more of a, um, consumerist type of relationship than a personal relationship, particularly in cities such as well, Coventry. Um, the, um, the fact that we're often, in, in terms of time, we're in very linear ways of thinking and being, always thinking of the next meeting that we've got to go to, um, very much in our heads. Um, so I'm a scholar as well as a practitioner, so I know what it's like to um, function in the thinking mode, but there's often a lack of of actually in the being node and um, more being able to be in that deep time node which which mode which is our capacity to receive and take in and connect and so one of the arguments I'm going to make is that in terms of a relationship with the environment as well as needing the um, rational scientific approaches 
we also need these other approaches that connect us more to what it is we're studying and um, connect our, our being more to this. So in indigenous societies um, have retained these ways of being and knowing. Um, I understand, I don't know much about Brexit, but I do understand that there are a fair few national nationalist politics um, behind the impetus to vote to exit from the, um, from the EU. And um, one of the things that I'm going to argue is in order to actually tackle things like climate change, um, food security, food sovereignty, the quality of our water, uh, this has to be a collective effort and it has to be across peoples, um, and I would even say across species. So it's actually the impetus to reach out. And so we have some forces that are really, in terms of some of the nationalist forces um, that we're encountering these days, and, and that's occurring in the face of unemployment, um, scarcity mentality, um, we have the challenge of actually having to reach across and really work with each other and understand each other's perspectives. Um, so this, this picture um, is very much around the theme I've just been talking about, making a collective impact. On the right hand side is actually a typical um, social innovation diagram. I, some of you may be familiar with it. And it's talking about how small innovations can gradually kind of latch on to each other and find common ground and begin to influence policies and regimes and open up spaces of deeper um, cultural shifts and change and perhaps the, kind, the kinds of cultural shifts and changes that we need. It's also it's quite a technical kind of diagram too. So I'm, I'm appealing to um, the more the, the rational side of our sensibilities in this. The one on the right, um, it's one of my favourite pictures, it was taken from the Elders' Voices Summit, and to me that represents the more um, intuitive, kind of deepened way and embodied ways of being that we need. And th this is actually some youth round the fireside at dawn preparing the pit cook. That's the history of that picture. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a story, a historical story about deepening into place and becoming of place and so you've mentioned that I've mentioned that we that I'm going to talk about three different imperatives that I think are important in this times the first one is the imperative to deepen um, or to become of place the second is the imperative to reach across sectors cultures disciplines and the third imperative is the intergenerational imperative to understand the different temporal ecologies that different generations are grounded in. Which, um, and generations these, day, these days are changing very quickly. Um, when I was growing up, it was a generation every 20 years. Now I think the changes and the shifts are so quick, it might be something like 10, maybe even 7 years. And one of my concerns is that, as a person of my age, I don't think I understand very much about the realities that some of the younger generations are facing. We've only got to look at some of the predictions, um, you know, that what's, what could occur in terms of climate change, food security, to think, well, actually, they, they have very different temporal realities and ecologies than what older people do. Um, so this story, the story of becoming of place, so in um, an indigenous cosmology, so indigenous simply means people who are of place, that the people who have occupied a place for a long time and know and know in that place really well. Um, and there's also there is of course the political um, concept of indigeneity, of indigeneity, the first peoples of place, right, the, tr the traditional guardians of those territories. I'm aware that's a concept that England has been so colonised by so many different people that's a concept that's got a little bit, it's less well known here. Maybe that's something for our discussion, but that's my sense of things. So, the, so in Māori cosmology, Māori, the indigenous people of Aotearoa, um, the reality is composed of three main parts. The Moody, which is the life force 
fact that every being has a moody, every animal, every plant, the wind, that every element has a moody, and the moody or the life force energy is interconnected, okay? It, one, it connects the whole cosmos up. Tinana, which is a physical reality, so the moody is embedded within Tinana, physical reality, and then the wairua, which is the spirit. So this is the story about the kumra, and how the kumra, which is a root vegetable, it's a sweet potato, was brought to New Zealand. So some of my ancestors, um, who were considered to be indigenous to Aotearoa, New Zealand today, the Ngāi tribe, came on a waka called the Mata Atua, and with them, from southeast, um, the southeast Pacific Islands, they bought the Kumara. Here they are coming to New Zealand. They arrive in New Zealand. One of the first acts of intergenerational resilience, right? So carrying forward, carrying the life force, carrying the resilience, thinking about the future. One of the first acts they did was they had a ceremony to implant the moody, the life force energy of the land they had come from and of the voyage into the ground. That was the first ceremony. And um, I'm going to just diverge a bit to say they were great sailors. They had to sail thousands of miles across empty ocean and so attuned were they to the environment that if there was no sun, there were no stars to navigate by, there was no wind, they would actually lie in the bottom of the waka, the canoe, and they would sense and feel which the slightest movement right, of the current. Subtle, subtle. Extremely high navigation skills. So that, that was how they were, that was how attuned their beings were to the environment. So they had the planting of the moody into the ground. The next thing they had was the planting of the kumara. They had the ceremony to plant the kumara. And in, in time they began farming practices. However, they were in a brand new environment. The kumara was not going to grow the same way as it grew in the islands, right? It's a colder climate, it's a wetter climate. So they had to be aware of the different toho or the different signs that would tell them when to plant the kumara. So the kofa is a flower in New Zealand that comes out. When the kofa comes out, that's the time to plant the kumara. So I'm trying to impart this acute attunement to the environment, right, this as of being. When a particular um, te potu te rangi came out, a particular star constellation, that was the time to harvest the, the kumara. However, some of these signs could be different within a geography of 50 miles or so. So again, that acute attunement. The such the kumara even then became embedded into the culture, the cultural fabric, right? So there's a saying that says, you know, don't basically don't brag, you know, and that the kumara doesn't brag. It's a, quite an ordinary looking vegetable. It doesn't brag about its own sweetness. So. So this is, this is not just necessarily, for many New Zealanders, the kumara is a commodity you go and buy in the shop, right? You, you're hungry, you need to boil up some sweet potatoes, some kumara. But it's also embedded deeply into the cultural fabric. So there's that personal relationship with it. Um, intergenerational resilience, I'm talking about this. This is a whakapapa stick, um, which is a way of recounting genealogy in Māori society. And um, so, the, so the, the genealogy, the resilience is where that we're talking about is with, uh, within humans, from elders to youngers, youth, youth to elders, but also across species, being very interconnected across species. Okay, so <coughs> I know that everyone has different um, thoughts and there's many different meanings of Resilience. One of the, um, just a brief point I want to make is that the social ecological resilience I think is a really 
great concept because it gets us thinking about how human culture and people connect to the environment. What's that relationship, right? And, and it, it off offers the possibility for cultural critique. How does our particular culture and the epistemologies and ontologies on which my culture is built, how does it view the environment? So that knitting together of social ecological resilience, it's great. It's also different um, from the concept of collective continuance, which is held, which is another concept of resilience held more by indigenous societies, which is much more related to that, um, I guess, the view of Moody, that life force energy that permeates everything and sees us very much embedded in the natural environment. So this is reflected <coughs> in the literature, for example, if you read some of the literature around social ecological resilience, it talks about water or the earth as an ecosystem that of service to human being, right? Ecosystem services. You see that language in the literature. That's very different from thinking about water as an alive and an, an animate being. Um, my personal perspective is that I think water is one of the most oppressed beings um, on the planet, right? If we're looking at it from a perspective of, of collective continu continuance, it's not just a service. Um, that's actually that was actually very clear, River, um, in Innisfruck. Um, but um, some of the water in Canada and Ontario um, is pretty oppressed, I would say. Um, oh, okay, so. I'm going to play you this. This video is of a toxicologist from the University of Saskatchewan who has the scientific toxicologist side, but she's also talking about some of her learnings about water as a being that she learnt from some of the, um, I think, the Cree First Nation people in Saskatchewan. I'll just As a toxicologist, I work with First Nations communities, um, looking at um, the challenges um, and barriers to accessing safe drinking water. And as a result of that, I reflected um, how we view water in modern society. And if you look back over time and in history, water was very sacred, very uh, spiritual. It was utilized for um, cultural ceremony, but over time as a result of industrialization and the growth of the human population, it has become, it is seen as a commodity. And it is something that is now seen as owned rather than shared. Uh, through my research uh, with communities, I've, I've learned that um, water is a spirit. It connects all living things. And if you think about it, water is, is the thing that connects everyone. Because without, and all living things, because without it, there would be no living Okay, so she's giving that perspective. I think that's an interesting to see uh, someone who's speaking from the perspective of the physical sciences, but also integrating that other epistemological perspective, that interconnected perspective. Um, her father, by the way, is actually um, Hindu, but it's from India. Uh, so, she, so Lalita has an uh, interesting mix of cultural backgrounds. Um, <coughs> so I essentially, um, in indigenous cosmologies, in Māori cosmology, um, Papa Tuanuku, or Earth, um, is, um, it's of the receptive um, feminine principle. I've already mentioned Turtle Island. I can, I can come back to indigenous feminist ontologies a bit later, but I want to say, I think it's important to say, I think that this particular viewpoint is really what's missing from the whole debate around social ecological resilience. And I think it can really help us come back more into a um, more relational way of, of being. This um, principle, so I'm going to want to argue that 
During the process of, of imperialism and colonisation and the, the expansion of um, British Empire, but also the ex really it was, cap it was all around capitalist expansion, that what happened was that deeply relational way of being, that, um, that more feminine principle, was really totally subordinated under capitalism and colonisation. So this, and, and that continues today in a multitude of forms. So um, this particular picture is a, from Saskatchewan, it's about the 1870s, and this picture relates back to a time when the Government of Canada brought in an act called the Peasant Act. And this act, um, and it was part of the Indian Act, the Indian Act confined the Indigenous peoples in Saskatchewan to reserves. Um, totally eroded the, the, the nomadic hunting gathering way of life where there was that deeply relational way of being and said and by the way we're now going to get you to do farming um, however we're going to give you in far we're going to give you inferior farming implements to what we've given to the settler people that we've brought in from other countries and we're also going to, you've got to have a pass system to get off the reserve and you've also got to get our permission, the government's permission, if you want to do any trading. So what it actually created, and I was having this discussion with Ian earlier, as well as, um, this was all in the context of, ca of uh, capitalism, as well as creating a much more utilitarian relationship to the land, right, it also created an underclass whereby the, the First Peoples could not possibly compete with the settler peoples in terms of actually making a decent living off the land and, and making money off the land as well because they were limited in terms of implements, they couldn't get off the reserve to trade, they even had to get permission to trade. So it's an interesting um, historical piece because if we think of food sovereignty food security, the commodification of water, um, as well as the dis disassociation of the, from the environment, right? There's a whole class, that you cannot divorce social inequities from our relationship to the environment because there's that same disconnect condition, the disconnect between humans and the disconnect from the environment. So that's some of the colonial history around us. Um, Okay, I'm going to, we're of time, so I'm going to just keep going a bit. The Alliance for Intergenerational Resilience, um, our first gathering was at the Elders' Voices Summit um, in Victoria, Canada. And the reason I'm going to talk about this for a couple of minutes was because it was a gathering over four days of people aged between 17 and 80 years of age, um, both in the community gym of the Sayot First Nation, but also on the land. And the nub of what we were trying to cultivate in this gathering was actually intergenerational resilience, the, the, the connection between generations, between cultures, and um, with, with the land. It was, um, so there is Victoria, um, and that's the um, Salish Peninsula and uh, South First Nation are located just there. Um, here's one of our days um, of connecting to the land. We actually, it was around food. Um, their traditional um, salmon and cedar are keystone species, are key um, elements, both um, food-wise um, and culturally-wise, of the South First Nation. So it was a, as you can see, the salmon's drying on the rack. And while the food cooked in the earth oven, um, we listened to the stories of the elders, we listened to the stories of the land. Um, for them, um, salmon is actually a relative. So in, in their particular cosmology, now we'll just forward a bit, in their particular cosmology, at the beginning of time, the um, supreme being, exiles, um, actually took humans, threw humans to the wind, threw humans to the ocean, 
to humans, to the stars. Those humans became the ocean. They became the stars. They became the wind. He also threw some humans who became the salmon people. And so for the Sao First Nation, salmon are their relatives. When it comes to traditional reef net fishing, which they are working to revitalise as part of their food sovereignty and food security, they actually, so this is a traditional net that they, are, and they have actually, now they're bringing back, they're now bringing back this type of fishing. That net actually has a hole in it in a particular place which allows a certain number of fish to escape. That's the conservation message, method they have. They also, at the height of the salmon run, when the salmon are passing through the Salish Sea, they'll stop fishing for four days, right, to allow those salmon to get through, to get up into the river so they can spawn. So this is part of, this is some of the work that the Sayat First Nation are doing in terms of intergenerational resilience. And the elders are passing this knowledge on to the youth. So it's about, and it's about also the transmission of those values, right? So the salmon's not a commodity, it's our, it's our relation. That, that we need to respect and um, and also preserve. So it's a different way of it's a different, very different way of being, and that um, is one of is the Alliance for Intergenerational Resilience seven intergenerational resilience hubs. So what we're doing is we're seeding seven intergenerational resilience hubs and working with communities to develop and evaluate practices of intergenerational resilience which strengthens the connection to the land, the waters and also between human, humans, um, human generations. Um, okay, so where the, Ian, how much time have I got? It's about another 15, we're a bit late getting started, so maybe 15. 15, okay, I'm going to speed up a bit. This is some of what's happening in the Tauranga Moana um, with my own tribe. Um, you can see that there's been a lot of um, incursion into our waterways. Um, the w within a, a period of three years, there was something like 87 oil spills. Um, so that's like totally um, wrecked some of the fishing grounds. Um, and, and so those and those oil spills, of course, um, if you think of colonisation, that all relates back to the confiscation of the lands. Um, the whole harbour is now run by the port of Tauranga, although the local tribes are now co-managing it. But all of these things, um, you know, way, modes of capitalist production and globalisation, you know, of course, as we know, having impacts on the local environment. So what we're doing there, <coughs> this actually here is a kinna. It's a New Zealand type of shellfish. Um, and different shellfish stocks have been um, affected by what's been happening with the oil spills in the environment. And the youth become disconnected from the land because there's, not, there's, there's a lack of good shellfish to gather, loss of language, loss of um, meaning of what particular species mean culturally, what they can be used for food-wise. So there's a, um, the University of Otago are working with the local tribes combining um, science with Mataranga Māori with traditional knowledge. So um, these are this is uh, they're happening over weekends. They're occurring on the Marae, on the uh, the meeting place for Māori, and they're um, teaching the young people how to ma how to measure um, the quality of water. Um, this one, the poor kinna in the lab, <laughs> and to, that's. Um, yeah, making kinna babies in the lab. I wouldn't want to be that kinna, um, but there it is, sitting sitting in the lab. But you can see that. So this is actually to encourage comfortableness with scientific methods, but to also enfold this in the traditional fold these in the traditional ways of being. You know, so being on the marae, hearing the ancestral stories, being um, with your elders, also learning some of the scientific ways. So it's also, it's also about getting more Māori into education, secondary education as well. 
Um, so what, there was a quote I just missed, but the essence of that quote is that what some of the young people are really clear about is that they have knowledge to pass back to the elders because um, the conditions that they are growing up in is so, are so different. So the knowledge transmission is not just one way, it's two way. Okay, I mentioned that the other, uh, the second, uh, second imperative I think that we face at these times in terms of being able to really generate a collective impact on um, human environmental well-being is being able to reach out across other cultures. Um, so that's, that's the, the intercultural imperative I've called that in creating rituals or practices, practices of creating common ground. So one um, project, this is, and this is also a hub of the Alliance for Intergenerational Resilience in Toronto, Canada, is um, Indigenous women coming together with racialized immigrant women to look at issues of food sovereignty and food sustainability. So the Riverdale Immigrant Women's Centre actually have a rooftop garden that they've been developing, and many of those women are from um, uh, India, Pakistan, more those parts of Asia, not so much Southeast Asia, and they are interested in being able to bring their culture and their food traditions in, but they're also wanting to learn more about indigenous traditions and indigenous cultures. And also because many of their um, cultural perspectives see the world as being interconnected, they're keen to talk with indigenous women to see how they can begin to revitalise traditional knowledge around food sovereignty and food sustainability and to be able to practice this. So um, these are, this is some of, from some of the research that actually was the precursor to this hub getting off the ground and we actually came together to discuss the issue of um, mental well-being in relationship to land. Um, as you may be aware that most people when they often who are experiencing uh, mental health difficulty, it's either medication or at the best it's family therapy, but no one really looks at that relationship to land and the whole issue of displacement from land and cultural displacement, um, which many migrant, um, it, it's a global, um, diaspora is a, it's a global issue, and so that, that disconnect. So this, this whole project is around reconnecting. Um, yeah, so there's just some of our um, discussions. And it, it, what, um, so we'll call this, you know, building relational and epistemological solidarities and finding that common ground. Most of the state practices actually set in Canada separate out um, indigenous and migrant communities. And while there are some very important differences in terms of indigenous communities are actually of that land, there are actually some similarities in terms of um, uh, interconnected worldviews, um, racialization, economic disparities, th there's, there's a lot of common ground as well. So we also gathered in New Zealand, migrant and indigenous woman. This gathering was actually on my marae. It was the first time this had ever happened and um, it took I guess the point I want to make here is sometimes the estrangement that can go on between peoples and the, the, the tensions. So it took quite a lot of doing, um, but we, we got there and we had a really uh, good couple of days. And we, um, this I do want to talk about this. The concept we used to try and gel was the concept of turanga waiwai. That's a Māori word and it literally means, can mean stomping ground. So, um, Wai wai, his legs and turanga. Right. It also means place of power. Where and, and, and traditionally it related to land. So if somewhere was your turanga wai wai, that was your land, that was the place where you had mana, you had power. An important difference that we found when working with indigenous and migrant women is that indigenous women talked about turanga wai wai, place of power as being much more directly connected to land. For migrant women who were less likely to have land that they had a direct relationship with, Turanga Wairau was more socially 
located, right? So that it was, it was just as it probably more to do with people in social relationships. This gets to be really critical when we think about how we begin to bring different worldviews together. And one of, the one of the points I want to make is that when we're thinking about food sovereignty or joining forces around how we're going to make the water better quality, is that people are often grounded in different political ecologies or different immediate realities. So while they might share similar worldviews, if they do, their immediate realities can be different. So a really obvious one here is that people who are of place, right, often their notion of citizenship, right, is encompasses the natural world. People who were migrant, not of place, often their the, there's often a lot of pressure that citizenship is related to being a good consumer, a good earner. It's um, so you more you can be more immediately grounded with a net neoliberalist paradigm in terms of how you're trying to exercise your citizenship. So that was a key difference that we found. Um, and it, one I would add to that, if we think of the whole thing about generational imperatives, um, that, that table actually has another couple of columns that I haven't put on here, but it has um, positivism, um, critical paradigm, pa participative paradigm, indigenous paradigm, and the different um, views of human agency and agency imperatives, different ontological perspectives, epistemological perspectives. I think there's an important generational one. And I think if we think of generations, that generations are grounded in different temporal realities and they have different imperatives. So most of the young people I know these days um, did not necessarily expect, for example, they're going to own a house. Um, they're, they're, they may not have the same types of aspirations that I have or even the same um, privileges that older generations have had. So I think, I think that's really critical um, that we really work with and really understand um, the realities for the younger generations. So that's, a, that's another um, column that needs to be added there. Um, they're, they're very different realities. Okay, so thinking about if we were to work together to, with different innovations in different areas to try and make a collective impact on food sovereignty, for example, as the Alliance for Generation Resilience is aiming to do, we have to begin to consider the divergent um, worldviews, the divergent political ecologies that people are immediately part of. We have to consider that um, different organisations have different um, motivations and, um, and immediate um, realities that they are dealing with. So that also means, so for example, the Riverdale Immigrant Women's Centre, bringing um, immigrant and indigenous women together, are planning on developing a resilience strategy for their communities. But that may be a very different priority in an urban Toronto than the Sayat First Nation, right, who were living on their tribal lands and they're very much focused on cultural revitalization, the revitalization of their of their of the their traditional language. It's a different, it's a, they're related, but it's a different kind of focus. So when we think about developing shared measurement, right, and, and how we can begin to generate synergies and collective impact, we have to think about the different nuances of each context. Um, I think it's worth working together from different locations in terms of sharing knowledges, sharing experiences, um, seeing what we can generate together. I think it's also complex work 
and it's work that we particularly need to be able to draw on the principles, both um, the, the indigenous feminine principle and the more masculine Western scientific principle. We have to be able to integrate both um, into, uh, to run our waka or a ship that we're going to be able to steer best to navigate through these um, turbulent times. Uh, kia ora koutou.